Fiber is absolutely an essential component to a healthy diet. As opposed to vitamins and minerals, fiber seems sorta meh, not that big of a deal. However, fiber offers a ton of health benefits that vitamins and minerals cannot. Fiber has been shown to control blood sugar levels, lower LDL cholesterol, normalize the movement of stool through your colon, and reduce the risk of constipation, colon cancer, diabetes, and hemorrhoids. Fiber comes in two flavors, soluble fiber and insoluble fiber. Soluble fiber is found in foods like oats, peas, carrots, barley, and fruit. When dissolved in water, it makes a sticky, gelatinous material, hence it being soluble. Soluble fiber molecules include arabinoxalin, fructans, and pectin. Insoluble fiber is found in whole wheat flour, corn, vegetables, beans, and nuts, and is made of cellulose, hemicellulose, and lignin. Though fiber is fairly widespread across the food spectrum, it's entirely possible to live on a diet without fiber. This altered diet would consist of protein, fat, and sugar. So pretty much just eating chicken, steak, fish, eggs, cheese, and milk, and ultra-refined sugary foods, like cake, cookies, and ice cream. With no fiber in your diet, the organ that's going to be most affected will be your large intestine, followed by your small intestine. Here's how your body works on a high-fiber diet. You ingest a fibrous food, say, beans. The food is ground and churned in the stomach where it's made into smaller particles passes through your small intestine where 90% of the nutrient absorption takes place and then passes through your large intestine. Throughout this whole journey, the fiber is mostly unchanged molecularly. This is because humans lack the digestive enzymes to break down fibrous molecules like cellulose and fructans. Cows and other herbivores, on the other hand, do have these enzymes. Instead, humans have bacteria in our colon that break it down for us. Most bacteria that do this are located in the sigmoid colon. These bacteria break down about 50% of the fibrous material and release hydrogen and methane gas as a byproduct. The other 50% is excreted from your body. Here's what happens when you don't eat fiber for an extended period of time. Stage 1, mucosal breakdown. The gut bacteria have no external food source to live on. In order to survive, they break down the mucosal lining of your colon, as the mucus is made of glycoproteins which contains carbohydrates. Breakdown of the mucus lining causes malabsorption and inflammation of the colon, leading to diarrhea and constipation. If you're still excluding fiber in your diet, then we continue on to stage 2. Selective Bacterial Overgrowth The low-fiber environment selectively grows bacteria that are able to thrive in low-fiber conditions. Such bacteria like E. coli are especially tolerant of low-fiber environments and are able to outgrow other bacteria. They weren't able to outgrow before because they had to compete with other populations that were living on the high-fiber diet. These low-fiber tolerant bacteria feed on other macromolecules like protein and lipids, which through your current diet are quite plentiful. Yes, 90% of the protein and lipids are absorbed in the small intestine. However, that 10% that isn't absorbed is consumed by these hardy bacteria. And the final result of not eating fiber is stage 3. Intestinal Migration with no competition in sight, they continue to grow and migrate upwards in your large intestine to find more protein and lipids. In your small intestine, large colonies of bacteria aren't supposed to be here, and when they do colonize in the small intestine, it becomes a condition known as small intestine bacterial overgrowth. When bacteria grow here, the small intestine responds by releasing a protein called zonulin, which opens the gut barrier junctions of the intestinal wall. Oddly enough, this also happens to people who have celiac disease. By the way, you can learn more about celiac disease in my video where I eat pure gluten. So basically, when you have small intestine bacterial overgrowth, your body actually mimics the symptoms of celiac disease. This causes consistent diarrhea, malabsorption of nutrients, constipation, bloating, inflammation, and increases the risk for colon cancer. How does one know they have small intestine bacterial overgrowth? Well, the bacterial growth has to be measured in the small intestine, and the only way to find out is to go there and take a sample. The bacterial sample is taken in the jejunum, which is between the duodenum and ileum of the small intestine. The procedure is known as jejunal aspiration and involves sending an endoscope down your esophagus, past your stomach, and through the initial length of the small intestine. From there, a mucosal sample is aspirated and counted for bacterial colonies. Bacteria populations in your colon, where they're supposed to be, are typically over 100 trillion per milliliter. Whereas in the small intestine, it's usually no more than 10,000 bacteria per milliliter. 
Any bacterial samples above 20,000 per milliliter is indicative of small intestine bacterial overgrowth. Luckily, the fix for this is very simple. Treatment with antibiotics and return to a fiber-rich diet. However, this could have all been prevented if you just ate your vegetables.